Hi. So we're going to start a new chapter now, um, chapter 10 on phase transformations. And what we're going to be talking about in this chapter is how phase transformations take place and how they take place over time and how the time rate of change of a phase transformation can really affect the structure and hence the properties that come out of a material. And so if you can control the parameters of a phase transformation, then you can get some interesting structures which you can exploit in material science for their properties that might be different from the equilibrium phase transform properties. Um, so, to talk about the phase transformation process, it um, consists of two steps, nucleation and growth. Nucleation is defined as the beginning of the phase transformation process where you have these little nuclei or seeds that act as templates where the crystal then grows outward from there. Um, for the nucleus to form, uh, the rate of addition of the atoms to the nucleus has to be faster than the rate of the loss. Um, and once it's nucleated, then growth proceeds until equilibrium is attained. There's two different kinds of uh, growth or nucleation, homogeneous nucleation and hetero heterogeneous nucleation. So in homogeneous nucleation, the nuclei actually form in the bulk of the material. Um, and this takes more time. It also requires more super cooling than um, heterogeneous nucleation, which takes place at defects within the material. So I want to show you a simulation of um, homogeneous nucleation that was um, published by Shibuto and colleagues. And the idea here in homogeneous nucleation is that you have random thermal fluctuations of the material, um, of the atoms in the material, and they're bouncing around. And then what happens is in homogeneous nucleation, due to those random thermal fluctuations, occasionally you'll get some atoms that come together more closely than other atoms. You'll get a denser area of the material. And then that can trigger a spontaneous nucleation of a crystal growth. That's shown here in this, um, in this simulation. And so what you'll see, this is a molecular dynamic simulation with a million different atoms in it. I've slowed it down to half speed so that you can appreciate um, how this happens and perhaps see the nucleation points. Um, and it was published in 2015 in Scientific Reports. So here you see the atoms kind of fluctuating and moving around and then what you'll see is I believe right in here there'll be a point where it gets denser for just a second there it is, and then the growth happens outward from there, okay? So from that dense spot, um, the growth happens outward. And then there's another simulation in just a second, um, once this one finishes up, and you'll see it happening. It's just under two different conditions. You can see there the nucleation formed. It formed in multiple sites at once, kind of, just due to those random thermal fluctuations where you have a more dense spot, and then it grows outward from that dense spot. Okay, so that's the idea of homogeneous nucleation. Okay, so in heterogeneous nucleation though, um, rather than the density being high because of a random idea, it's easier for crystals to nucleate if there's a nucleating surface already present. If there's already a defect or something like that, then you can get a change in the density of the material just because of the defect. And a defect could be something like the walls of your container or impurities or dopants in the liquid phase. Um, if you've ever done that experiment where you grow sugar crystals when you were a kid and you watch the crystal growth. What you do is you dissolve that sugar in the hot water and then you put a string or a stick or something inside of the crystalline solution or inside of the sugar water solution and then the crystals will form preferentially on the string or the stick um, and, uh, and grow outward from there. And so that's the idea of there being a defect present and the nucleation of the crystal growth becomes easier in the presence of that defect. Um, and so it can happen at um, smaller temperature differences. I'm using the term super cooling here and that's when you have a molten liquid phase and then you chill it down to a temperature much less than the melting um, point of the material and that's called super cooling and then that can speed up the rate that you have nucleation. 
Now, to describe mathematically what's happening during a phase transformation, um, the Gibbs free energy is often used in the expressions. And this is an expression from thermodynamics. And often at times it gets used in chemistry a lot. The Gibbs free energy of a reaction, for example, is often cited um, to figure out whether it's a spontaneous reaction or not in chemistry. But the Gibbs free energy is defined as the work needed to create something like a compound or a solid or that the energy that's released when that compound or solid is destroyed or melted. Okay, and so the mathematical expression for that is that the change in the Gibbs free energy, which is symbolized with a G, is equal to the change in the internal energy of the system minus the temperature of the system times the change in the entropy of the system, symbolized by S here, plus the pressure times the change in the volume of the system when it occurs. So this is the total amount of energy that's needed um, when you uh, create something. Now you might remember from your introductory level physics course, physics 1150, 1151 level course, that the change in the internal energy of the system is equal to a heat plus the work. Okay, so subbing in for that for the change in the internal energy, um, Q plus W minus T delta S plus P delta V. And if you've taken thermodynamics, you might recognize that Q plus W plus P delta V is equal to the change in the enthalpy of the system, delta H, and then minus T delta S. So the Gibbs free energy is related to the enthalpy minus T delta S. Okay? So these are all the thermodynamic parameters that um, you plug in to figure out whether or not something is going to form a solid, for example, or a reaction or lots of other things. If your Gibbs free energy changes less than zero, if it goes negative, then that means that your reaction can happen spontaneously. If, however, the change in the Gibbs free energy for a system is greater than zero, then that reaction is going to need an input of energy to make it happen. It's not going to happen spontaneously. So what we want to see is these Gibbs free energies, delta G's, being negative and having a large magnitude, large negative value. Um, of course, we always talk about the delta G because just like with potential energy, it's the change in these things, uh, these values like the Gibbs free energy or the enthalpy or the internal energy. It's the change in the value that matters with respect to whether or not a reaction is going to happen. The overall value is meaningless, much like a potential energy. The overall value in the potential energy is not super meaningful. It's the change in the potential energy that's important. Okay, when we go about figuring out what our expressions for these Gibbs values are, um, we're going to make certain assumptions. First of all, we're going to look at homogeneous nucleation and the expressions for homogeneous nu nucleation. We're going to look at heterogeneous nucleation as a perturbation of homogeneous nucleation. And so we're going to look at the expressions for homogeneous. Second of all, we're going to assume that the crystals are going to be spheres just for the sake of simplicity of solving for these expressions. Okay, so there's two things, um, two competing effects uh, having to do with uh, nucleation. The first is the volume free energy. And this is the free energy difference between the solid and the liquid phases in the bulk. All right, the energy is going to be negative if the temperature is below the melting point. And the total should be proportional to the volume of the material and the temperature difference. Okay, so regarding the temperature. The volume free energy on a per unit volume basis is equal to the chain, the latent heat of fusion. Okay, so this is the latent heat of fusion. And that's the energy that it um, loses when it becomes a solid. You might remember these from physics 1150, 1151 or your thermodynamics class. And then that's equal to uh, times the temperature difference. T sub n here stands for the melting temperature minus the temperature that the system is at divided by the melting temperature. So this is the volume free energy per unit volume. And then to, to get the total volume free energy, per, you, know, you, you multiply the volume free energy on a per unit volume basis by the volume. And because we've assumed that it's a sphere, then you multiply that by 4 thirds pi r cubed, where r is the radius of the little sphere crystal. Okay, so that's one effect, the volume free energy. There's also going to be a different energy associated with the surface of the crystal. Remember we talked about this, surface atoms have a different potential energy than bulk atoms. Bulk atoms are bonded in three directions, all along three dimensions. Surface atoms don't have the uh, bonds above them, they're sort of dangling there. And so that makes their energy higher than atoms in the bulk. 
So this is often referred to as a surface free energy or a surface tension and symbolized with gamma. And this energy is positive. It takes energy to form a surface because those surface atoms are at a higher energy than your bulk atoms in a solid. So the total surface free energy should be proportional to the surface area of your crystal. In this case, we're looking at a spherical crystal, and so the uh, surface area is 4 pi r squared, and then times that uh, surface tension gamma. So here's a plot of the two competing effects. You have the surface effect curve here in red, which goes as 4 pi r squared gamma, and then you have the uh, volume free energy, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed times that delta g nu, which is the uh, on a per unit volume basis. And because that's a negative value, that curve is going to go down here in blue. Now, as the crystal grows, the surface area to volume ratio changes rapidly, okay? So for small things, nanoscale type things, the um, surface area to volume ratio is a big number a lot of the atom is surface area. And then as it grows and moves towards a bulk material, the surface area to volume ratio drops rapidly. And so you're going to see um, those two competing effects. When you sum those two curves together, the red and the blue, you get this green curve picture here. So it goes up for a little while until it reaches a value called the critical nucleus or critical radius, and then it's going to start to drop off. Okay. So to get the total free energy, you sum the surface um, and the bulk contributions and volume contributions. Um, and we're going to look at that critical nucleus or critical radius as the value where um, you're really shooting for in order to get crystallization to happen. So what we can do to solve for that critical radius is to take the derivative of this total free energy curve and set it equal to zero. And that will give us the value there at the peak. So if we do that, <clears throat> we take delta gt with respect to r, set that equal to zero, then we're taking the derivative of these two terms, the surface 4 pi r squared gamma plus the volume 4 thirds pi r cubed delta g nu. When we take that derivative, we get 8 pi r gamma plus 4 pi r squared times delta g nu. I indicate the uh, critical value for, at the peak with a little asterisk to match the um, notation in your textbook. And now we want to solve for what that r star is. Um, and we just do a little bit of algebraic manipulation to find that your critical radius is equal to minus 2 gamma over delta g nu. Okay. Now, if we plug that back in, that value of the critical back into our total free energy expression, then we get the total free energy at that critical radius value, and we end up with, after a little bit of algebra, 16 pi gamma cubed over 3 delta g nu squared. So you can pause me at this point, make sure you can follow my algebra if you'd like. So there's our value for our Gibbs free energy at that critical radius. And repeating, there's our value at the critical radius. R star is equal to minus 2 gamma over delta G nu. And to remind you, we said that this volume free energy on a per unit volume basis was equal to the latent heat of fusion. And that's the amount of energy that's lost when it becomes a solid on a per volume basis. Um, this is something from... Remember, thermodynamics, intro thermodynamics that we covered in our Physics 1150, 1151 class, um, or in thermo. And then delta T is the temperature difference between what temperature it's at and the melting temperature divided by the melting temperature. Okay? So if I plug in uh, delta G nu into this expression for my critical radius, then I get the expression cited in your textbook for the critical radius. R star is equal to minus 2 gamma times the melting temperature over the latent heat of fusion divided by the temperature difference. And what we can see is that um, although your latent heat of fusion and gamma are weakly dependent upon delta T, what we can see is that the dominating effect is that the greater your temperature difference is, in other words, the lower you drop your temperature below the melting point, then you're going to get a smaller critical radius. And that's what you want if you're trying to solidify something. You want to super cool it by a large delta T, um, and then that'll cause the critical radius to drop, which means that it's easier for crystals to nucleate. Because remember, it's dictated by those random fluctuations of the atoms, and of course it's going to be easier to get random fluctuations that are smaller, right, um, for a larger density, having that happen in a smaller value than in a larger value, okay? 
So for typical delta T's that they drop them down to supercool them in factories, then your critical radius might be say 10 nanometers or so. Okay, so let me do an example problem here to kind of give you a, an idea of what typical is. So let's say that we have a copper, and copper has a melting point of 1,085 degrees Celsius or 1,358 Kelvin, and it nucleates homogeneously at 849 degrees Celsius. So calculate the critical radius if you have your latent heat of fusion uh, minus 1.77 times 10 to the ninth joules per meter cubed, um, and your... Um, your surface tension of 0.2 joules per meter squared um, for the latent heat of fusion and that surface free energy. So plugging into our expression for the critical radius for those values, we get minus two gamma Tm over the latent heat divided by that temperature difference. So that's minus two times 0.2 joules per meter squared times 1358 Kelvin divided by minus 1.77 times 10 to the ninth joules per meter cubed over the temperature difference, which is 236 Kelvin. Then we get 1.3 nanometers for that critical radius. Okay, a couple things to remind you of or point out here. Remember, latent heats of fusion, when you go from a liquid to a solid, that's negative um, values of that energy. If you go the other way, the energy is positive, of course, but we're interested in trying to solidify something. And what do you do to solidify something? Um, let's say that you've got water, you want to freeze it, make it a solid, you put it in the refrigerator. You're taking energy out. So that's a negative value for your latent heat of fusion. If you're going the other way, if you're melting something, you have to put it on the burner of the stove, okay? And so that's adding energy in for a positive value, just to remind you of that basic physics concept there. Okay, why is the nucleation temperature so much lower than the melting temperature? Well, there's a couple of competing effects, of course. The number of stable nucleation sites is plotted here in red, okay? And that's a function of temperature. It's a decaying exponential, um, and you get uh, the number of nucleation sites actually dropping off like that as the um, temperature uh, difference changes. Now, the frequency that the liquid atoms diffuse, that's going to increase with increasing temperature, okay? So um, the, the rate of diffusion is larger for hotter values, and so you see that blue curve there. Now, when you sum those two curves together, you get your green curve, and so you get kind of a peak as to what the nucleation temperature um, is. So you get this peak value of nucleation at a certain given temperature um, due to those two competing effects. Um, and that's where you want to put your liquid if you want to super cool it and get homogeneous nucleation. Now, of course, homogeneous nucleation isn't usually the full story. The reality is that you don't actually have to cool your molten metal hundreds of degrees to get it to form a solid. Usually, your molten metal starts to cool at a smaller value of delta T. And that's because it's going to nucleate at surfaces or defects, and that reduces greatly the barrier um, to form that solid. So you can usually say that your heterogeneous value for your Gibbs free energy, the heterogeneous nucleation energy, is equal to whatever you have for the homogeneous times some parameter S of theta. And S of theta is going to have a value between 0 and 1, and it's going to have smaller values for lower angles. In other words, let's say that you have a dye or a material, you're trying to solidify a metal, you've poured it into a mold, for example, okay? Well, that material, the solid material, and the metal, the molten metal that are in there, may sort of want to be next to each other to a varying degree. If the metal likes <laughs> the mold that you've poured it into, then it'll wet it, okay? In other words, this bead of liquid that forms on top for a largely wetting system, it'll spread out, and that angle will get smaller and smaller and smaller the more this uh, liquid material likes the solid material that's underneath it, okay? They'll wet one another. If that happens, then you're going to have, for smaller angles, a smaller value for that S of theta, and that means that it'll reduce that um, homogeneous value more, and there'll be less of a barrier, okay? So the more that your molten metal wets the, the cast or whatever that you've poured it into, the, the quicker you'll have that nucleation occur, okay? The quicker it'll occur. And then once nucleation's occurred, then the nuclei grow, and the growth rate is controlled by the rate of diffusion, 
And of course, the rate of diffusion is greater for higher temperatures, okay? So you can have some sort of trigger due to a, um, uh, a defect, and then boom, your crystal will form super fast, and it'll condense into a solid a lot more rapidly. Okay, I hope that's um, relatively clear, uh, but if you have any questions, you can always come see me. Thanks.